Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can see me and hear me. Uh, I'm speaking to you live from a very uh, windy South Wales, so I hope the nature doesn't intrude too much into our conversation. My name is James. I'm the British Council's Director, UK and External Relations, and I'm, I'm your host for the next hour. And it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you to this part of the Edinburgh International Culture Summit, both as chair of this session and on behalf of my organization. We're really thrilled to be partnering with the summit again, as we have since 2012, having collectively taken on the challenge to do things a bit differently this year for obvious reasons. We all thought it was important to forge ahead and convene international conversations on the important role that culture and education has in helping us respond to the current challenges of the pandemic and contribute to the renewal and the recovery of the future. And today, as we've just seen the film, we're invited to respond to what that saying is, I thought it was incredibly compelling uh, piece of work and the role of culture in education. We know it's integral to support in the development of our young people, our economy, and as Andy said, the wellspring of wealth creation and the well-being. Um, so I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at some of those issues. Um, now, the less, see, the less you see of me, the better. So my job is obviously to hear from our, make sure you hear from our brilliant panelists and then from those of you who have joined from all across the world who want to make a contribution. I could already see comments from Algeria, from Pakistan, uh, from Nigeria too. Um, so for those of you who want to make comments, could you please use the chat function? Okay. And for those of you who want to ask questions, please use the Q&A box. I hope that's really clear for everybody. And my job will be to make sure that we get as many of those comments and as many of those questions into the discussion. Um, so I'd like to start by introducing our brilliant panelists. Uh, Asal Habibi, who you saw in the film. Uh, she's an assistant research professor of psychology at the Brain and Creativity Institute, University of Southern California. She will be our first speaker. She'll then be followed by Liliana Morales, who's an alumnus of YOLA, and she's a microbiology and sociology student at the University of uh, California, San Diego. Hi, Liliana. And you, the two of you are joining us both, I think, from the West Coast of the USA, which is incredible. Good morning. And then we have Emma Roos, who is a member of the National Youth Arts Advisory Group, uh, Young Scott and Creative Scotland. You're about to enter your third year at Queen Margaret University, Emma, so uh, good luck with that. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Asal, um, who will speak, and then we'll go through all of the panellists, and then we'll get some questions, and we'll have a, have a brilliant conversation. So Asal, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, James. I'm delighted to be here. Good morning from Los Angeles. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this discussion and, and talk about the importance of music education, at least from my perspective, um, and get the other's perspective as well on the on the lives of our children and their social and emotional well-being. Uh, as you watched in the video, my work uh, focuses on um, a research project with the Los Angeles Philharmonic and their youth orchestra program, YOLA, uh, for, about which we'll hear more from Liliana. Uh, but over the past seven years or so, uh, our work has shown uh, from a scientific perspective and also from a neuros neuroscience perspective, really from the underlying neural and brain mechanism that music training and participating in musical activities are not only fun and bring happiness and, and connectedness to children, but they're important um, and critical in the development of their um, cognitive abilities, um, their social skills, and uh, their emotional abilities, um, uh, abilities and, and skills that we like to foster in, in children, abilities such as empathy and, and connectedness and, and compassion towards others. I. Um, because we covered most of this in the video, I wanted to comment briefly today about some of the follow-up work that we have done, um, given the, the current situation and the pandemic where we, for the most part still around the world, we are separated from each other physically. Um, so we have been connecting with the students who are in our research program to see how they've been using music as a means of uh, emotion regulation and how they, they use this toolbox that I refer to in the video um, 
to really be, deal with the current crisis. And what we have seen a uh, report from the students who've been in our program who are pretty much in their youth orchestra for the past six or seven years is that not only they've been using music to connect with their friends um, in as a way of social connected um, connection. So for example, getting on Zoom and do have, um, have impromptu concerts and performances. So as a way of not only just picking up a phone and call and talk with someone, but actually have a performance and have the synchronized activity together at the same time time. Uh, but also, um, we have heard reports that music pr provides this protected space for them, uh, for regulating their emotion, for taking a break from the stress that we are all going through at this time. So to pick up their instrument and dedicate time um, to play a piece of music and to kind of uh, remember the memories they have from this piece of music and, and use that as a mean of social and emotion regulation. So um, I think my beginning message here is to just for all of us to think about um, not only importance of music education in every day, but really what it shows in these times, how it's critical in our children's life and how it shows us that we really would have to think about investing uh, in having access for every child around the world um, to music and art education, so as to provide them with these opportunities um, to, to help themselves um, to uh, kind of battle the stresses that it's going to be ongoing one way or the other in our, our lives. Thank you, Sal. That's a brilliant start. I love something you said in the video about getting our brain circuits going. And I, and I feel like, I hope, I hope that's what you said. That's only what I heard. So I think that's a great start and a great provocation. Now I'm sure we'll come back to some of the issues that you've raised uh, just now and in the film. So we're going to move on, if that's okay, uh, to Liliana. Liliana, are you there? Yes, hello. Brilliant. Take it away. Hi, so my name is Liliana Morales, and as previously mentioned, I am an alum of YOLA. Um, I have been a part of YOLA for 11 years, so I started when I was six years old in 2007. Um, and since graduating, I have become a YNI fellow, so YOLA National Institute, which is very much a branch of YOLA that is um, invested in helping students uh, stay connected to the music world in college. Um, and so now I am at the university and I'm studying microbiology and sociology. So while I'm not studying music, one of the main things that I have come to realize is that music has very much still been a part of my life, um, even though um, I'm studying something in the STEM field. And so one of the, one of the ways that I have uh, come to think of that, as Asal was mentioning, has been through very much a set of skills. Um, and I want to talk about three specifically that I have found personally um, have helped me not only in my life as a musician or as a student, but very much in my everyday day to day life and just going and uh, going through the world at large. Um, so one of the main ones I would uh, want to highlight is time management. And um, it was interesting in watching the video um, and uh, the direct work that Asal has with the science is that uh, time management very much is a skill that is a far transfer effect. So it's not something that we learn directly and explicitly when learning how to play music. It's something that we come to learn um, as we're practicing, as we're figuring out how to um, practice for a piece or for a concert, learning that it's more uh, beneficial to go measure by measure than just running to the piece multiple times because we're able to get into the more nitty gritty um, when we focus on specific things. And so time management as a student and as starting in university um, and with complex and very large classes um, has been extremely beneficial because it has taught me how to study. It has taught me how to prioritize my time, uh, especially now during COVID when all of my classes are done remotely and they're done online. Um, as a student, being able to manage my student life with my home life and with work and just being able to juggle everything. Um, Picking that up and learning that uh, through music education and through YOLA has been one of the primary tools um, that I am most grateful for uh, because it has very much taught me how to organize um, myself. But one of the other main ones is communication. And communication is a very interesting one to speak on because of how differently communication is now that we're living through the pandemic. Um, but before the pandemic and just in, when I was a student in YOLA, um, 
And since graduating, I have come to realize that uh, there is a very primary difference I have noticed um, between my peers in Yola and uh, when I was in high school, I was also at an arts high school. So very much technically, until graduating, I was surrounded by everyone that was involved in art or in music in some form. And going to college now, I noticed that one of the main differences is self-advocacy. So when you are in an ensemble, whether that be in an orchestra or in a group class, um, you very much learn how to be a team player. Uh, but the minute you step out of that and the minute you start working on solo repertoire, uh, there is a very, very large emphasis from teachers to focus on musicality, on phrasing, um, and very much how to express yourself and express your voice through music. Um, and yet, now that I'm not majoring in music, and while I still do practice my instrument um, every day, aside from that, uh, I have been able to see that when you take the music away, the skills don't go away. The skills stay there and they sort of just manifest and take on a different sort of um, uh, sort of different set of being. And so with communication, one of the main things that has arisen has been self-advocacy. So um, I noticed that my Yola peers that um, are the ones that go to office hours or they try to invest more time in communicating with teachers and helping build those connections and relationships and very much finding their own voice, um, which is something that is very nice hearing the science behind of uh, from a South's perspective. And just one of the last things I want to mention is community. Um, so especially now during a pandemic when it feels like we're all a bit separated, um, community has been, and I think will always be one of the most integral parts of us as not only humans, uh, being social animals, but also just as being individuals that are flourishing and as growing up as a child, uh, community is sort of the foundation of everything that there is uh, to life. And so music has a very interesting and beautiful way of bringing everyone together. Uh, and one thing that I have noticed through uh, Yola and just music education at large is that it creates bonds that will very much last a lifetime and in its most basic form it is a tool of social networking but if we look beyond that it very much comes down to community and friendships and not only friendships within the ensemble it's friendships across schools across communities and with families because when a child learns how to play an instrument, I know when I was learning how to play an instrument, it was not only about me as a musician, it was a group work. It was my parents helping me practice. It was me helping share my schedule and all of us sort of accommodating um, to make time to something that was so important. And so um, now that we're in a pandemic, when it feels like our communities are a bit separated, having music as a tool to bring us all together um, is, is absolutely beautiful. And so in spite of all of this um, and everything going on with uh, many, many budget cuts, uh, one thing that I would urge policymakers um, to recognize uh, as as a child, or not not as a child anymore, but as a person that has gone through music education, uh, one thing I would urge policymakers to recognize is that when they invest in music education, they're not only investing in music. That's very much the tip of the iceberg. Um, they're investing in, as Asal said, a toolbox of skills that will expand beyond that. It is very much interdisciplinary. They're investing in academic success, in time management, in communities, um, and in fostering healthy, healthy and happy family units. Um, and so music is just the tip of the iceberg. And I would very much hope that um, not necessarily to prioritize music over other subjects, because you can never ask of that, but to ask that when making these policies, uh, they understand that music is a lot more than just learning how to play an instrument. It's about learning how to be prepared for the future. That's brilliant, Eliana, thank you so much. Community is the foundation to everything. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And I'm, there's lots of things that we'll come back to that you've raised, uh, I'm sure in the Q&A. Can I just remind um, everybody to when they go into the comments and introducing themselves, just, well, actually to do that, to make sure you're here saying who you are and where you're from. 
um, and so we can keep the conversation going. Liliana, thank you so much. Um, Emma, I think it's over to you now. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm here from more of a policy perspective than Azal and Liliana, who seem to have much more practical hands-on experience than I do. Uh, I'm a member of Scotland's National Youth Arts Advisory Group. So we are a group of young people from the ages of 14 to 25 who've been working for the past six years across Scotland to assist with cultural policy and give feedback and help make sure that young people are really involved at the very heart of the decision making process. So that started in 2014 and the group has evolved obviously as the young people have gotten older and grown out of it and we have recruited new young people and it's been the most amazing experience. Uh, the group primarily started as part of the Time to Shine strategy, which is Scotland's 10 year national youth arts strategy. And one of the key points of the strategy was having a group of young people forming a steering group and helping to make those key decisions. And through that, we run a nurturing talent fund, which allows young people in Scotland to pursue their own creative projects, which we completely assess ourselves. So all the funding is given to young people by young people, which is amazing. And we've also run two national unconventions, which are national youth arts festivals to celebrate what Scottish young people are up to and the amazing work that's going on across the country. As well as the NIAG, I've also had experience as part of the Year of Young People in 2018. Scotland really places a huge amount of power and trust in its young people. And in 2018, they decided to do that by running a themed year and the entire year was dedicated to young people, to young people pursuing creative projects, pursuing sports, all of these things. There were six key themes, one of which was culture, which was obviously where I came in for my level of interest. So I was a cultural theme leader for the year and we worked with the Scottish government and we had the opportunity to go to the European Parliament and run a workshop there talking about the year as well. And there's a real power given to the young people that were involved. It's uh, something that I think Scotland does really well and I always advocate for that to be replicated over various different countries, various different organisations. I think there is something so key about young people having a voice, particularly today when we're talking about culture and education, a large part of that impact comes down to young people. Most of the people in education are those young people between five and 20 going through school and university and colleges. So it's so important that we then involve the young people in that key decision making to decide what they're going to have and what they want and what they need. And something we say as part of the NIAG a lot, which ties in so much with what Asal and Liliana have been saying this afternoon or this morning for you guys, uh, is we say that the important thing is these skills are being developed in the arts and through the arts and we're taking these transferable skills and giving them to young people so that they can move on and do whatever they would like to do with their lives. We really also understand and see that value that we've been talking about so far. As part of the NIAG, we've been able to be involved in the past two culture summits as well. So it's really lovely to be invited back. It doesn't quite feel like a summit unless I've been involved in something. So it's lovely. The first year we attended as youth delegates where it was an entirely separate strand to the event and it was an amazing opportunity. And then the second time last year, last year, two years ago in 2018, we attended as knowledge partners of the event, which was amazing because we really helped the summit try to integrate young people and it keeps moving even further obviously on this panel two of the three panelists are young people which is amazing when we're talking about something so close to young people's hearts um, so I think that's all very very important and I just kind of wanted to give a little bit of insight as to where I'm coming from today and encourage people to think about the involvement of young people in their decision making processes. Uh, thank you very very much uh, and thanks to our three brilliant panellists for um, their provocations. Uh, we have some questions coming in, but, but I wanted to take the advantage of being the chair, if, if that's okay, and bring you all in on a question, and, and it's come through in, in the Q-Haze. You're all operating in slightly different policy contexts, but you've all spoken, I think, about the need for, or, or, or you underpinning a lot of your arguments, the, the need for um, good, good policy making. It takes into account the issues that you've raised uh, in the education system. So, and you've spoken about Scotland, which of course, you know, is an exemplar. Um, how, what do you think policymakers need to do more of given, 
know, Asal and Liliana, you're in a very different context. And what can we learn from each other on that? And then I will go to Davis, uh, who is a, one of our partners for the question. But if you, if you, if you, Emma and Liliana and um, and Asal could start with that, and then I'll uh, I'll ask Davis to pose his question to you, please. So Asal, why don't you go? Why don't you take that first? Sure, absolutely. Um, I, I love what um, uh, Emma described in terms of the youth participation in policymaking in Scotland. Um, that's uh, very unique and, and it would probably be very helpful to have the youth voice uh, really everywhere around the world. Um, what we see uh, in, in, at least in the United States and in California from uh, where I live is that during the past decades or so, the emphasis on art education um, has diminished. Uh, and uh, there is gonna, there was, there's been a lot more emphasis on what we call here STEM education, science, technology, math, engineering, which is as important. Uh, I've mentioned in in the video that I'm a neuroscientist by training, so by far I believe that uh, investment in science and math and reading is important. What we have to see is um, we want to look at a whole child development and 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 development um, of, of a child without educa without education in arts and music is, is not complete. So I think what I'm arguing for is to have equal investment um, in arts and music, especially when we look at children from who are coming from communities who do not have access to private music, music education or private art education. If we make this as part of our school curriculum and invest in it, so every child has access to music and art, and maybe a child picks up music and become a very successful musician, uh, or they pick up music and use the skills that they learn through music to be successful in other domains, but if we do invest in it, we have given everybody an equal chance to use these skills to succeed in the future. So I think um, having that insight, having the insight that it's an early investment, um, children as young as elementary school probably need to have access to music and then um, it will pay off later. So an early investment for future, um, I think is an important insight to have in this domain. An early investment and a patient investment as well. Exactly. Great, uh, Liliana, would you like to come in on that point and then I'll come back to Emma before this. Yes, of course. So um, one thing that was mentioned in the video um, that Elsha had said um, fr the, from Yola's perspective. So there's only so much that an organization can do um, in terms of reaching a broader audience. And so I think very much as Asal was saying, um, having grown up and having firsthand experience the diminishing investment on music education, um, just growing up, going through elementary to middle school um, and the shift to STEM education. Um, I think it's very much a responsibility, not only of um, outside or after school programs to invest in music education and help with that, but very much um, in, in policymakers and uh, investing in a budget for arts education in schools. Um, and so I think one of the main things with that is uh, I have noticed a shift from STEM to STEAM education. So it's no longer just science, technology, engineering, and math. There's also the A uh, for arts education. So it's being able to blend all of that. And very much as Asal was saying, um, having arts education be a tool uh, and just having it as an option. Because if we don't give children the option to choose that and to develop that, then they're never really going to know what they're missing out on when it can be very crucial for development. That's great. Many thanks, Liliana. Emma? I think in Scotland, we are very lucky in that the current curriculum does encourage uh, the option of choosing arts. Uh, so when I was in high school, it just shifted to the new curriculum for excellence system, which means that in your third year up until the age of, I think it's 14, but don't quote me on that, you are, it is mandatory to take a art subject so it can be drama, it can be music, it can be more traditional art, um, but you have the option and then you have to take one of those the same way up until that age, you have to take a science subject. So there is that spread. However, there is still issues with encouraging music outside of school and the class issues that come alongside who can afford to take the time to practice an instrument. Um, so what I would say 
to the policymakers is that they need to definitely keep that open mind and be open to changing their minds as well. And it's something I, I like to think the people that we speak to in Scotland are very good at, even in the six years that I've been a member of the National Youth Arts Advisory Group, we have seen such a dramatic shift in the cultural landscape of Scotland. So I, I live in hope that it will keep moving at this speed and we will keep moving forward. Um, but I think the key thing to me is just keeping an open mind and being ready to listen to everyone. Thank you, Emma, very, very much. And uh, Davis, you're, you're uh, joining us from Yale, I, or you, you, you study at Yale, uh, and one of our sort of global partners in, in, in Summit. And I'm gonna hand over to you to ask the panel a question, if that's okay. And very sure. To the audience, keep the questions coming in. We're gonna look at them, we're gonna group them together, make sure you get your say. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today and so inspired by the uh, uh, many perspectives brought to the table, uh, especially the, the panelists here in the video. Um, I was struck by Andy Haldane's comment in the video about 10 years old being sort of a peak point in a child's uh, potential for creativity and the importance of um, being immersed in um, artistic um, influences at an early age. And it, it struck me, um, having just returned uh, from a year abroad working uh, as an architect in Shanghai, but also um, on a musical outreach in the city for, uh, for their youth orchestra, just how um, important immersion is for children, um, uh, as, as Lilian has also pointed out, at, at an early age to um, spark curiosity and creativity in many other aspects of life. Um, and I even think to, to my own uh, background, going to my first symphony concert through uh, a, a young audience's uh, program in Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm from, um, how, how crucial that was to sort of spark that curiosity. And I'm, I'm interested in the current position we're in as a, as a world inflicted by um, the isolation of a pandemic and, and the um, lack of opportunity for immersion, uh, uh, you know, and, and in-person um, uh, collaboration, whether um, there are any technologies, policies, or programs that the, the panelists today are, are aware of, uh, such as the Impatico that was mentioned in the video, that um, are emerging at a time like this faster than ever um, to allow children the access and the, um, the uh, immersion that they need uh, at a young age to, to be inspired by um, art. Thank you, sorry, I was a bit slow on the unmuting. Who wants to take that first? Asal, do you want to go first? Sure, um, I can just comment a little bit on, on the program here, um, the, the YOLA program that um, with uh, being it very challenging, but they have really managed to transform the, the platform to an online platform um, and, and provide opportunities for children to take their instruments home. And, and, and it's, it's um, I, from a child development perspective, it's not easy to keep a seven-year-old engaged on a screen uh, to play music. So they have really done a very good job, the LA Philharmonic and their partners to come up with an engaging curriculum that is not only just playing your instrument, looking at a screen, but uh, have opportunities to engage and, and to share. Um, so I think uh, using technology in that way is, is helpful. And I, I know that many programs, we in our research uh, have looked at um, choir in and older adults and actually across the, the uh, lifespan. And because we cannot have in-person choirs anymore to, to look at the uh, importance of music participation in well-being, we have moved that to an online platform and we're working with the music school at the University of Southern California to come up with a again, an engaging one hour of choir where you can't really synchronizely sing together, but it still provides you a space to check in, to hear other people's voices, to um, have a place to feel belong to. So I think a lot of those things that we are missing is being together and connecting um, is, you can't translate it to an online. It's not the same thing, but, um, but I think we are fortunate uh, to have the technology. And also if you already have the toolbox of knowing how to play an instrument, then it's easier to get on and just kind of fidget and try to find a way to, to synchronously play with another person. Thank you, Sol. Uh, Liliana, do you want to add to that? 
Yeah, um, so definitely taking uh, an online platform approach to music education. Um, and one of one of the things I have noticed, I have a little sister uh, and she's nine years old. Um, and so one of the things that we struggled with just even in person was how to make music theory and learning music theory entertaining. Um, and so one thing I've noticed is that, well, uh, an online platform really isn't the same when learning uh, music. So just like as far as technique and playing your instrument, um, it has been very helpful in terms of music theory uh, because there have been apps that we use uh, to help like read music and practice music history. Uh, so that, that has been one of the very beneficial things um, and learning just uh, as a teacher and as a student, um, how to use interactive tools uh, just every day and I'm excited to see the possibilities of once we leave the pandemic, how um, teachers and, and just music in general uh, is gonna be able to use these online platforms back in the classroom and integrating them uh, to bring a more beneficial approach. Thank you very much, Liliana. Emma, did you want to add to, to what's been said? So I would completely echo Liliana's last point. I'm so excited to see how in the future when things get back to some semblance of normality, we can take all, all the little things that we've managed to develop in this time whilst we've all been stuck at home and integrate that in. Something we're, we've been talking quite a lot about as the National Youth Arts Advisory Group is people with additional needs who maybe couldn't do things before all of a sudden things are now developed that will allow them to experience things um, potentially people who maybe wouldn't feel comfortable in, in a full room of people at the theatre now have the opportunity to watch broadcasts online from the comfort of their own home and experience things that they wouldn't necessarily get to experience and the same is happening in education at universities they are making things digital and it means that you don't necessarily have to be there all the time if you have caring responsibilities and things like that and it's just allowing people hopefully as we move forward different ways to engage with culture and education it ties together very well right now um, and really develop their skills however they can at that time so I'm quite excited about it. That, that's brilliant thank you all. Well, Davis is, does that does that answer your question and did, did you want to come back with I don't know if you're able to come back with any comments but uh, did that cover the ground? Oh I think yes I'll... it sure did it sure did <laughs> thank you very much for the panelists for um, shedding some light on some of these New initiatives, thank you. That's great. Um, Emma, can you just so keep your mic hot as it were? Because th there's a question around the sort of the lessons learned and lessons to be shared of Nyag. And I was just wondering, you know, what given your involvement, what, what are the things that you feel you you would want to share with uh, colleagues and friends in other countries about what's what's worked for you uh, given your role in that organization? Mm -hmm. So I think the first thing I would say is that any youth engagement is better than no youth engagement. So please don't be too scared to try something because it's better that you're trying and working things out rather than not doing anything because you're scared of not doing it perfectly. So if fear is what's keeping you back, I would encourage you to just go for it. Um, as a group, it has taken a lot of development. We are all volunteers. So finding young people who have the time to spare and the passion to go alongside it and who are willing to give up this much time is obviously difficult and you have to kind of accept that the group does change and fluctuate as the young people move on with their lives and maybe don't have the time anymore that they once had. We never get anything done during the month of May because everyone has exams <laughs> and that's just a, a fact of doing the work that we do and we schedule around that. We use the summer holidays as best as we can and we really take the time then to focus on things and it's convenient that that's when the culture summit is because it means we can be involved with that at a deeper level. Um, the young people are out there and I think I would just encourage you to try and find them even if it's just a one-off focus group to start with until you reach that point where you feel more comfortable engaging on a higher level like this. If you are looking for advice on how you would run a group like that, I would highly recommend contacting Young Scott. They are Scotland's national children's and young people, children and young people's charity, and they have amazing work. They do work like the NIAG for various different uh, organizations. There's a young sports panel in Scotland. There's a heritage panel. There is so many different versions of this for different cultures and different sectors. 
that is incredibly valuable and they really know how to engage with young people on a non-tokenistic level so it isn't just doing the work and then being like yeah do you like that um and the young people just go yes or no and then you do it anyway um it's really engaging with them from the start of a project and making sure that what you're developing is what the young people want um and it's it's incredibly worthwhile when you get it right but doing anything is amazing so i would just encourage everyone to take that that first step great thank you very much we've got 135 people uh, from all over the world online and please please keep sending in your questions uh, just to continue with the scotland theme i think do we have jonathan from create scotland uh, yeah. to, to answer a question as well hi jonathan uh, hi thank you for having me and thank you it's been great to watch the video and hear the panelists speak so far so thank you all uh, my question was and actually emma has slightly touched on this in her last answer um i know that at the moment, there seems to be amidst um, everything that's happening with COVID, a real cultural shift. And I wondered if what the panel thought um, the challenges have been in terms of equality, diversity and inclusion through this period. And if there have been any particular barriers or if there have been any, um, I know Emma just used that great example of people who are maybe not so comfortable in public spaces suddenly feeling more adept at connecting through digital means, but I wondered if the panel could expand on that at all. Thank you, Jonathan, that's a great question. Liliana, why don't we start with you? Uh, hi, uh, so I definitely have uh, noticed, noticed uh, a lack of, or I would say just, a very real barrier in uh, not only just music education, but just education in general. Um, and so as we've been speaking through this, um, myself, Emma and Asal have all mentioned that uh, technology has been sort of like the unifying factor in being able to provide uh, these services and just this outreach to uh, communities. But in that, uh, I think, especially here, um, understanding that many communities um, and many children that are impacted by music education programs, for example, Yola um, here in Los Angeles, um, many don't have access to just technology in general. So for example, you can't ask a child to tune into their music class um, or, or even just school if they don't have access to uh, a tablet or a, a laptop or Wi-Fi. Um, so I think that that very much has been a barrier um, and that has, I think, exacerbated uh, previous like divisions uh, because the, what that means is that children that were already at a disadvantage previously are even now more so at a disadvantage because there's just no way to communicate and be involved in all of these resources. Um, and that's very much when having an instrument um, and just having previous somewhat musical knowledge comes into play because then um, even if there is no uh, direct music education, they're still able to maintain music as part of their everyday life and just sort of fiddle with it and figure out, go ahead um, on the, the music lessons that they have in their books. But uh, really quickly, one thing I did want to mention is that um, there's a lot of rhetoric as music education as a privilege um, and I think that that may be a bit harmful. I think we should stop viewing music education and just music in general as a privilege and view it more as uh, a basic right. It's, it's a necessity because um, if we view music as something that is a privilege, then when budget cups do come around, we can say, well, this is already a privilege and a luxury. And so taking it away is not necessarily taking away from the basic necessity, but that I think that's not the right way to look at it and understanding that music very much is a basic necessity um, and it, it should not be a luxury or something that's afforded only to those that can uh, provide for it, but something that everyone should have access to. Hearing music is a privilege, playing it is a, is a right. Um, Asal. 
Yeah, I mean, I very much echo uh, what Liliana um, uh, mentioned right now in terms of access to technology. I think we should do better in terms of uh, education broadly. I'm at a university and we want to be able for every student to have access to reliable um, technology, both in terms of accessing the internet and also the actual hardware to access um, to, to be able to uh, participate in these opportunities that we are creating also providing support for the parents so they have time at home to play and practice music with their children. So if music is just seen as this extra thing, so you have to take care of the homework in science and math, and then when it comes to music, you can just skip it because you have another 100 things to do, um, then it's, it's not an equal opportunity. If we provide music, as important as other um, uh, as other disciplines uh, that a school provides, and then also bring support to the families so they have time and space to play music. So at the end, not only that provides children with some space to learn music and get their musical skills better, but probably bring some joy and happiness to the family unit as a whole too. So if they are all singing along or all playing music, and it doesn't, I mean, I always, in talking with parents, um, encourage a lot of improvised musical activities at home. You don't have to uh, really have an orchestra and or really skilled musicians. Music is part of our evolution. It's been with us uh, for millennials. So it's really important to use that skills of like singing and drumming and doing things together. But I think providing that scaffolding for the parents and the, for the family unit so they have the protected time to have these um, uh, fun activities with their children is important. And again, if you're looking at uh, society as a whole, we would see that the disadvantaged uh, groups in our population are suffering from that more because obviously parents are more involved in, in the taking care of the family unit and not having that space as much. Thanks, that's all. Uh, Emma. Yeah, I 100% uh, agree with what Liliana and Asal have just said. And technology, particularly when we're talking about younger, children has been a massive barrier that we've noticed. Um, my mother teaches a primary school, so when you're trying to digitally teach a class of seven-year-olds, it gets very difficult very quickly. Um, and it's something we've been talking about as well. When we talk about young people in Scotland, we're talking about zero to 25, and we've always struggled with trying to reach those under 12s. Uh, over 12s, you've got the National Youth Arts Advisory Group, and you can have those discussions in a more formal manner but we've always struggled with that and that's become even more difficult when we're as removed as we are at the moment um, and social media isn't something you can use for the under 12s whereas over 12s social media twitter facebook polls things like that we can use to access uh, their insight um, so technology has been a massive thing obviously i spoke earlier about the accessibility side of it for people with additional needs um, though i am aware that that could be both two sides of a coin um, there could also be some people with additional needs who are finding it a lot more difficult now that everything is digital um, so you know we need to start and try and try and find ways around that as well i think um, to sort of bounce off of something asal just said the struggle that I've really noticed is that there is so much more of an onus on the parents the past six months because kids are just at home with their families and if your parents aren't particularly musical or don't have that confidence so many people feel like they're not a perfect singer so they can't be musical I know my dad would never try and sing in with me or in front of me he just doesn't have the confidence to do so um, so if you don't have that family, then I'm sure it's been much harder to try and stay creative and stay creatively active over the past time. Great, thank you very much. Jonathan, has that uh, covered everything? Brilliant. Um, so as we're sort of honing in on the final 15 minutes, I, there's more questions coming in. What we're probably going to do is just go to one of you, if that's okay, and I'm sorry if I, if I miss somebody, because we've also got Jonathan coming in towards the end, to, just to say a few words. Um, so, which we, someone said about the end of the pandemic, you know, when we leave the pandemic, and I, and I think there's there's probably a lot of concern that we're never gonna we're not gonna leave the pandemic anytime soon. Um, we may never leave the grip of COVID in one way, shape, or form. What is it about what we've learned during this period that's relevant to what we're talking about today? Do we absolutely need to keep? You know, what are the lessons that you have learned during the last six months as we've all been living through? lockdown um, 
And what do we need to change as a, as a result when we're talking about the role of culture in education? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a very good question and something that I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about um, during these past um, five or six months or so that we've been at home. I think one of the things that has become evident is that the investment that we do um, towards our children's education and well-being pays off one way or the other. If we have provided information and structure for children to be involved in culture, we can easily translate that to an online platform later and then go back when, when this is um, over and then integrate what we have learned online and in person and continue doing that. So I think these early investments, especially, um, I think Emma mentioned um, younger children and uh, from a neuroscience perspective, uh, a lot of learning happens in these early ages, uh, early ages of like four to six years old. There is like a uh, meaningful time to engage children at that age with uh, arts, with culture, with music. So I think it's important to keep that in mind that those investments are important. And we are when we are at the high time and more stable time uh, to just remember that, remember that uh, these will go a far way. Um, yeah, and, and then just one, one quick thing is that this opportunity to engage with people from around the world. Yeah. Uh, when, what, what we saw in Empathico is that this, somehow this time has provided um, a, a, an opportunity for children in Scotland and, and the U Youth Orchestra of LA to play music together without physically having to be there, which has its own challenges. So also kind of giving us this, I think remembering that we are connected and, and these op this time has provided us to see these connections more evidently in terms of being connected from every with everyone around the world. And then when we go back, kind of remember to kind of continue these collaborations and these um, participation across different cultures. So we kind of remember and value our, our shared humanity in that way more. Brilliant, thank you. That's a great answer. Ileana, I'm going to come to you because Stanley, who is in Nigeria, has asked a question around in, on, the, on, the, on the theme of inclusion, but he has an eight-year-old son who has hearing loss, and he's eager to know how um, children with, uh, well, his deaf child, but also uh, other children might get involved in, say, the YOLO example. How, how do you work with young people who um, have a disability, or, uh, or um, any sort of set of learning challenges. What, what, have, what have you taken away from your experience that would help Stanley? Yeah, um, so one of the main things about uh, YOLA and just music education in general is making sure that it's accessible to as many people as possible. And um, in our orchestra, we actually had uh, a few people that had disabilities. And one of the main things that I always noticed was um, a lot of communication uh, between the parents um, and uh, the children. So making sure that uh, the teachers are able to provide um, as an enriching as an experience to all students, um, regardless of any uh, obstacles that may be present. Um, and so one of the things that I noticed was um, we had uh, a student in our orchestra, uh, Adam, who was um, very, 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 very bright. And um, he, so the way that we came around, let me rephrase that. <laughs> so um, one thing, uh, that was a bit complicated was um, just sort of uh, keeping a, like keeping attention. So for example, um, that's one of the main things with learning music online that is a bit difficult. Um, so just keeping children entertained and making sure that um, they don't get distracted. And so one of the things with that was making sure that teachers are able to just be informed on what they can do and making sure that teachers recognize that there's never too much that you can know. So for example, what may have worked with one student is not gonna work with another student in the same way, shape or form. And so making sure that um, as educators and just as um, people that are, are taking on the responsibility to teach other children, we recognize that there's always a lot that there is to be learned and we should always come at that with an open mind um, and having the, the space and time to be open to having conversations about things that can be done differently and constantly striving to improve programming um, and, and to make it accessible. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Emma, there's a question around, um, the, I'll read it. 
do you have an opinion on the on the types of culture that best reach out to a broad range of children? I know that's 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 maybe a challenging question, but you know, you you you've got a lot of experience with NIAG. You know, what works best in the Scottish context? And I guess what, what's worked best when you think about internationalizing that? And you know, we've heard about the relationship between Scotland and Los Angeles uh, earlier on. Um, but what works well and what works best when you think about international collaboration? So something that I know a fair bit about, obviously drama is my speciality, that's sort of what I grew up doing and it seems like that's a really easy in for a lot of young people to access art and creativity and then from there they quite often spread off to music and things like that. Um, there's been a couple of really amazing projects that we've sort of been aware of between a youth group in Germany and a youth group in Scotland who created a drama piece digitally and then visited each other. This was obviously all pre-COVID um, and they visited each other and performed together and really collaborated. And I think it's a really easy way for people to start to engage with arts and culture and also gain some of those transferable skills like confidence. Obviously it's a massive, massive side effect of being involved in theater and so I think that's a really amazing one, but something we really try to do as the NIAG is encourage people in a wide variety of art forms and the Nurturing Talent Fund in particular allows people to really experiment with different art forms. We funded young people who want to do scripture, like calligraphy and all of that, graffiti, everything. So we're really open to encouraging people to do whatever makes them feel the most creative and however they feel they need to be expressing themselves. Um, so it's, it's amazing to see everything that everyone's up to, but, but I hope that's useful. Yeah, very useful. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a few minutes left uh, and then we're going to welcome Jonathan into the room. And I wondered if I could come back to you by way of sort of starting to sum up uh, the th with the three of you. About what we've heard today. We, we heard Andy talk about the secret source. I really like that, you know, unleashing the potential of young people through creativity uh, in the classroom. Uh, so you, you, you spoke, and I'll repeat what I said earlier, my favourite phrase of the day, you know, getting our brain circuits going. We clearly live in a world that um, where, where absolutes are present, and sometimes uh, the art of moderation, as our friend uh, said on the video and on the film, isn't always possible. If, if there was one thing, I know it's a bit of a cliche question, but if there's one thing, and I think it goes back to the question about what we've learned from the, the, the global pandemic, that you feel would really, in your policy context again, but also globally, perhaps, really unleash the potential of young people's creativity, what, what would you put your finger on, given everything that we've learned, everything that we talked about today, and everything that you feel passionate about and have articulated beautifully? So Emma, your, your mic is hot, why don't you go first? I think for me, it's just everyone keeping an open mind and using the new technology that we've developed in order to connect with each other across the world like we are just now and contribute creatively with each other and then encourage young people to do the same in opportunities that I'm not sure we all thought were possible until COVID has changed the world as we know it. Thank you very much. Um, in no particular order, Liliana. Are you still there, Liliana? Because I think it's it's pretty well known that if there is... Hello? <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. We, I we've got you now. We had a bit of a bit of a pause, but please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, uh, one of the main things I would say um, is an emphasis on community, because if there is a, a very strong community of trust and a foundation uh, based on love and just support, uh, whether that be from families, from orchestras, from uh, soccer teams, just any community in general. Um, I think that very much encourages young children uh, to, to reach out and to uh, sort of expand their horizons and, and venture into things that they have never tried before, or may be uncomfortable. But if there's a strong foundation, then that provides the basis for a lot. Brilliant, thank you. And last but by no means least, Asal. Yeah, I agree both with Liana and Emma. I just gonna add from a scientific perspective that our brain, our brains are plastic. We learn in different 
platforms we can adopt to different types of learning. So really encouraging to see that young people are creative to find different ways around technology to connect with each other. I think that's an important lesson to learn. And just remember that um, our biology and in throughout our evolution has adopted to different things. So we could take this as a new way of learning and connecting with each other. And then when we are past this, integrated to our past ways of doing things and probably having a better uh, product at the end. So yeah, just remembering the neuroplasticity and adaptability of our learning abilities. That's brilliant. Thank you all very much. And I, and I think just my own reflection, working for an organization which is specialized in global collaboration in culture and education in the English language, of course, uh, for the last 85 years, this, this is very much unleashing the potential of young people um, in good times and more difficult times is right at the core of what we do. It's what we've always done and will continue to do. So for me as a person, as a professional, it's been inspiring to hear our panelists speak today. Three brilliant women, I might also add, um, and I hope you have enjoyed and taken as much as I have from their contributions. Uh, I'm just wondering now to see whether uh, it's a time for Jonathan to join us to maybe do some wrapping up. I hope I can. Well, thanks, James. Um, uh, thank you particularly to Asal. Um, thank you to Liliana. Thank you to Emma. Thank you to our contributors from Wales, Scotland and California for a, a fantastic um, extension of what I think was a very inspiring um, uh, film on the, the summer theme. It makes me realize that all of these things are connected as as Gustavo Dudamel said, music is a fundamental human right, but so is dance and drama, poetry, cinema, sculpture, painting. These are all fundamental human rights. And in the words of another of the contributions, um, what you seem to be saying and urging governments to take seriously is a statutory responsibility to understand not just the human right aspect of this, the right to this, but actually the opportunity, um, the completeness, um, the benefit, um, the fundamental to the fundamental human right that is music is the fundamental be benefit to humanity, um, uh, particularly from young childhood, that are, that are, that are an experience and, uh, and a life in music um, and, and the discipline of music from early childhood can, 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 can give us. Um, uh, I'm very, very inspired um, to discover, and it's probably larger than this, but um, as you've all been speaking, people from 19 different countries, um, Algeria, Nigeria, Pakistan, Scotland, USA, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, uh, England, Italy, Netherlands, Kazakhstan, Switzerland, Turkey, India, China, Egypt, Spain, Romania, Mozambique, and Singapore. Um, the, and they're just the ones who've indicated to me online where they're coming from. And as I look at the 150 participants in this, I'm very excited by the fact that um, this webinar is experienced by people um, on, in a truly international way. Uh, tomorrow we continue these webinars um, with Fergus Linehan um, introducing Leah Pizar, human rights advocate from Paris, Andy Haldane, um, the chief economist of the Bank of England, uh, and Norris Puntilus, the Latvian minister of culture, who's also um, a, a well-known singer in his country. So join us tomorrow um, at the same time for a conversation about culture and social cohesion. Um, and please do um, look at the summit's materials that we've assembled um, on our website, www.culturesummit.com. And please do send us your feedback. We really must um, enjoy that. For, uh, and thank you very much for attending.